us, and I'm uh, happy to moderate this session. Uh, but you have to bear with me because uh, the news that I'm going to moderate was, I was not aware of this, so I'm going to sort of uh, improvise as we go along, if that's okay with you, yeah. Um, so this is a session that's going to explore uh, to see how uh, microgravity can be exploited um, uh, commercially. So you'll, you'll see, you'll hear uh, a lot from the panelists today of how they are planning to exploit microgravity and go beyond the Kármán line. Uh, so first of all, I invite all the panelists to please come on the stage. Um, please, yeah. Let's give them a lot of applause. Yeah. Please, yeah, please take your seats, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so what are the, uh, among the panelists that we have here, we have uh, from uh, uh, people from ISRO, and then we have all the startup companies uh, at various levels of their, uh, uh, you know, uh, plans to exploit the microgravity. Uh, so what we're gonna do is, uh, I'm gonna invite uh, the, the panelists first, introduce themselves, introduce uh, the, the organization or the company that they represent. So we'll spend some time uh, uh, knowing about these panelists. Then we will spend some time on discussions, and hopefully I can pose some interesting questions that I can, uh, you know, that will initiate discussions. And then uh, 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 towards the end, I'll invite uh, questions. Uh, uh, towards the end of the discussion, I'll invite questions from the audience as well. So that's sort of roughly the, my improvised plan for the moderation today. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, so maybe we'll start uh, uh, first with uh, with, Ze Ms. with Xavier. So he, he represents uh, ISRO. Um, uh, he's with the Human Space uh, Flight Program now. So let's hear from uh, Xavier and see what uh, you know uh, what he has uh, you know about his his plans and uh, or ISRO's plans on microgravity and, and so on. So, yeah. So I invite Xavier. Yes. Yeah. Uh, good of Good afternoon. Uh, I am Xavier Raja. I am from Human Space Flight uh, Center of Indian Space Research Organization. So as you all may be aware, our Human Space Flight Center is taking care of our first human space flight uh, mission to mission, uh, Gaganyan mission. So uh, in the Indian context, if you see, uh, till now the scope or the opportunities for microgravity experiments was very limited, but once the Gaganyan mission is there, we have opportunities for having the microgravity experiments. Actually, we had an announcement of opportunity in 2018 end, and we had overwhelming responses. We had many proposals starting from space medicine, space biology, to fundamental physics, to human physiology. And from that, some eminent panel of experts have selected few experiments, which will be going in the Gaganyan missions. Because our main advantage of Gaganyan mission is that one is you have the environment, uh, ambient environment inside the human uh, capsule, as well as the, it will be returning. So you will get to uh, get back the capsule also. Uh, the experiments also will be able to get, and uh, that experiments are already progressing, and probably we'll be having one more announcement of opportunity for the experiments. Oh. And basically with respect to, when you are flying a microgravity experiment in a uh, crew capsule or crew cabin, we can basically take two approaches. One is that we have the minimum interfaces with respect to the crew cabin, or we can provide all the housekeeping, including the power, telemetry, telecommand support to the uh, microgravity experiment, so that the whoever is uh, taking uh, that experiment, they can concentrate on the scientific and technological part. So initially, for the, our initial missions, we are going with the first approach, where, where we have the minimum interfaces, so that our risk to the crew module is minimum. But we later, we will be graduating to have a plug and play type of uh, environment where the, the experimenters can bring the experiments and have the experiments without needing uh, needing to bother about the housekeeping and all which will be taken care of by us. So thank you. Okay, okay thank you, uh, Zami. So maybe we'll move uh, next to Sebastian to the other end. Uh, so yeah, Sebastian, tell, tell us about more about yourself, your company, and uh, what is your plans to uh, exploit the microgravity? Yeah. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Sebastian Klaus. Um, first of all, thanks for having me here today. Um, this is my first visit to India, and um, it's really a privilege to be invited to this conference. 
So I am the CEO and one of the co-founders of uh, Atmos Space Cargo. Uh, we are a startup from Germany. We are four co-founders pretty much. Um, I have a double background. I come from the German military, but also with an aerospace engineering background. And my three co-founders, they come from the space industry, from Ariane Spas, from Airbus, from the German Aerospace Center, DLR. Um, and what we do is we develop technology to return any type of cargo from space. So specifically, um, the first capsule that we are now uh, developing, it's called Phoenix, is a small capsule that is uh, targeting the life sciences market. So it's got a payload capacity of about 100 kilogram of uh, pretty much living human cells. It's a pressurized vehicle, it's uh, thermal controlled. Um, and we have just uh, closed a, a 4 million euro seed funding round to build this vehicle. So we will fly it at the end of next year for the first time. Um, and uh, yeah, we are, we are really looking for partnerships with uh, people like the ones that we have here in the panel. So it's really exciting to be here. Um, who can help us really uh, target the life sciences market. Because what we really want to do is we want to help um, developing new drugs in space. Uh, we want to enable new types of research, both in life sciences, but then also later on in material sciences and other fields. And uh, so, yeah, this is pretty much a team effort and uh, it needs to be done with a lot of partners. Um, so I'm very happy to be here today. Okay, thanks, uh, Sebastian. So from Germany, let's go to Japan. So uh, from Japan is uh, Mr. Yoshioka. Sorry if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Yes. Yeah. So please tell us more about yourself and uh, your plans to uh, in space. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the uh, first of all uh, for uh, inviting me to the India and uh, this uh, great congress. Yeah. Uh, I'm Kohei Yoshioka, CEO of IDDK. We are the uh, Japanese company established in 2017. Uh, we are developing uh, uh, automated uh, uh, bio laboratories in outer space. Uh, 1,000 uh, 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 1, people are going to live in moon in 2040, and many organizations are working to realize this vision. But uh, space is an uh, extreme environment for human beings to survive because of uh, microgravity, space radiation, and uh, vacuum conditions. See, so uh, ISS is the uh, platform to study the effect of the, uh, those environments to the human beings, and it conducted 3,000 experiments past 20 years. But it's only 150 experiments in average per year. So if you really want to send human beings to Moon and the Mars, uh, it's not enough. For, so we need to scale up the uh, number of uh, experiments in outer space. So we use satellite. Uh, using a satellite, we uh, manufacture, develop uh, automated bio laboratories. However, uh, bio experiments require a microscope. Usually the satellite has a, a very uh, limited space, so uh, it's difficult to use uh, many number of the experiments. So we need uh, something, a new technology, like uh, very tiny, microscope, like a one chip, to get the uh, uh, microscopic image. And uh, IDDK has the technology. We call it uh, MID. It's a one chip microscopic observation. Sorry, I can't open, but uh, this is yeah, our technology, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, this is our technology. So. If you use our technology, you don't need lens and camera to get the image. So we will apply this technology inside a satellite to scale up uh, the uh, number of scientific experiments in outer space. That's what our company is doing. Okay. Thank you. Wow, sounds exciting. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Mr. Um, Yoshioka. So now uh, on to George. So George, uh, uh, tell us more about your plans uh, and uh, introduce yourself and your company as well. So yeah. Good uh, early afternoon. Uh, my name is George Weinman. I'm the Senior Director for Business Design for Space Systems Development at Blue Origin. Uh, Blue Origin has five divisions, uh, one of which is uh, what used to be called Advanced Development Programs and is now called Space Systems Design. 
Uh, we are a proud father because we just birthed another division called Lunar Transportation, uh, which just won the uh, three and a half billion dollar uh, space, uh, sorry, sustainable lunar development contract, SLD contract from NASA to build the second human lander, lander to go back to the moon as part of Artemis. Um, so uh, space systems development is a division that birds other divisions at Blue Origin. We're very excited about the possibility of how many different uh, things we can uh, develop uh, for future space exploration to enable thousands of people on the moon uh, by 2040. Um, my specific role is uh, focusing on how do we put the businesses together that will enable this. Um, so just like we're designing the technology and the space systems, uh, we also have to design the businesses that will support uh, or the structures or the partnerships that will enable these things to happen. And I'm responsible for that within my division. Um, Blue Origin, for those of you who don't know, also has uh, three other divisions. We have an engine division, which is building engines for uh, our new Shepard rocket, which is our suborbital rocket. Um, it's quite a large suborbital rocket. It can carry six people to 110 kilometers. Uh, I'll show a video maybe later if we have time. Uh, and we have our new Glenn rocket, which is a Saturn V moon capable rocket uh, with a seven meter payload fairing. Um, so Blue Origin does a lot of things. We're accelerating uh, our growth uh, quite a bit over the past few years. Uh, we're really looking forward to talking more about all the different things that microgravity can enable. Um, Orbital Reef is one other big ex exciting thing and I'd love to spend some more time talking about how we go from suborbital to orbital and interact with all these great technologies uh, our fellow panelists are bringing to the table. Thanks, George. So once I introduce, uh, uh, once Ajay finishes, and maybe you can show your video and talk about it. Sure. So, yeah. So, so last but not, last but not least is Ajay, uh, a startup from India. So Ajay, you can introduce okay. yourself, your company, and what do you do? Thank yeah. You. Yeah. Good afternoon, all, and uh, thank you, Satyan sir, for introducing me this, to the session, and then thank you, SA India, for organizing this uh, pretty new uh, topic, particularly on microgravity, which is going to you know be a, a next generation space technologies that is going to uh, take all the non-space industry to space. Uh, so I'll just start from, uh, since uh, I come from India, so I'm from the southern part of India and then I'm from the Madurai. And uh, we have been developing uh, space platforms for launching small satellites using some balloon technologies initially. And uh, we understand ourselves that, you know, there should be a technology that provides an access to Indian market not only for the space sectors, but also for the non-space sectors. For particularly, I can say, pharmaceutical industries, biotech industries, semiconductor industries, and of course, uh, the life science industries. So, India having a good um, series of launch vehicles, and even privatization in space has happened, boosted private companies to work on building launch vehicles. And you do have you know, various satellite programs, and satellite data has been used for various uh, perspectives. but we still have or we still lack in access to space for real applications, sending biotech or other experimentations to space and you know, build manufacturing capabilities and bring it back to Earth and then you know, make life in Earth much more simpler in using the, the unique characteristics that, you, that is already available in space, that is you know, the radiation, the microgravity, and also other unknown um, factors that is already in space. So Velon, since we have been working on the technology, uh, of building platforms. So we try to miniaturize the entire platform into a small box. And that box can, you know, be completely a subsidiary or maybe a, a new version of a, a space platform or international space station where you don't want astronauts or someone to, you know, control the experiments or handle the experiments. You can completely remotely control from being in where you are, you can use that. So I'm the founder and CEO of Velon Space. And uh, we do have other founding members and then uh, business partners who help us in doing these things. And uh, particularly, Velon is building two technologies. One is the lab in space. The lab in space provides you a capability of uh, testing the or uh, testing and providing research facilities for the sectors. So our entire lab can be miniaturized, customized, tailored made for all the industries, not only focusing on biotech also for the new coming semiconductor industries. So Velon is also working with Indian biosectors, Indian research institutes, research organizations, and we have been partnered with IIT Madras for some of our projects. And you know, our uh, capsule written partner, Sebastian, and then is utmost companies also here. So it's completely a joint venture. 
So we are trying to bring some values out of space by giving our own individual uh, uh, sort of uh, technologies into picture. So, uh, so before I just you know give uh, the, the, the other panelist. So what what Velon is trying to actually do is so right now we are trying to because this is a very new market and it's newly growing market. So we are trying to create an awareness of uh, how benefits of microgravity can be utilized for various programs. So right now Velon is doing that and um, yes, thank you, sir. Okay, uh, thank you, Ajay. Um, <clears throat> so so uh, before we go uh, into the discussion part, I'll, I'll introduce myself as well and what we do and why I'm here and sitting in the panel as well. So I'm a, I'm a faculty in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at IIT Madras uh, and my training has all, be, all been in manufacturing, science and engineering. And in the last uh, two and a half years or so, uh, uh, been coordinating a center, research center at IIT Madras. Uh, I'm calling it extraterrestrial manufacturing. Uh, the term that other people use uh, is in space assembly and manufacturing. I ISAM or ISM is something that you might have heard of. I'm calling it XTEM or ET manufacturing, as you can call it. And uh, uh, and what we have been doing is we have been uh, we actually have a, a, a microgravity drop tower uh, in our in our campus. Uh, there are about five or six towers in the in the world, and we have one of them. Uh, and we can get about two and a half seconds of microgravity in that tower. Um, uh, and we've been trying to see how we can study some fundamental phenomena related to manufacturing processes uh, in, the, in that tower. So, for example, if you take 3D printing, you know, metal 3D printing, for example, uh, you know, metal 3D printing is a long process. It takes, you know, hours or days to build a product. But, you know, the fundamental mechanism of metal transfer, how the metal droplets transfer and what happens during microgravity, for example, so that can be studied in a limited way in a two and a half second window, for example. Or you could do metal foam studies. Uh, can I, how, is, how do um, uh, you know, metals form in under microgravity conditions? How do crystals grow? Uh, for example, can I get some very glimpse of it in the two and a half second window? For example, um, uh, if I would do any spraying process involved in, in, for example, photovoltaic processes or semiconductor processes, for example. So, in a, so, so in, in a, there are some t limited studies that you can do. Uh, and, and you know, drop towers have been used for a long time. If you look, go back and look at the academic literature, there's a lot of so fundamental studies people have done on drop towers. So we are doing some manufacturing process related studies and, uh, and, and, and we have a group of faculty uh, from varying from material scientists to mechanical engineers like me to physicists and chemists uh, looking at this, uh, the, this, uh, this window. Uh, so, so that's what uh, I, I've been wor uh, working on in the last two and a half years. This is a fairly new area to me uh, in terms of exploring microgravity. So that's what I do uh, at IIT Madras. Okay. Okay, so uh, so uh, to, to, uh, maybe we'll just start with the discussion part here. So, so what I thought I will do for the discussion part is uh, we'll split the discussion into sort of three areas. Uh, the way I see it is uh, one is uh, launch, and then there's a platform required to do whatever you want to do, and then you have to bring the stuff back as well. So so uh, so we will sort of start discussions in this uh, roughly these three areas. Okay. Um, uh, so in these three areas, what I will sort of pose questions to you is, uh, um, for each of you, is uh, what are sort of the challenges that you have seen uh, uh, in, these, in these areas and how you are sort of overcoming some of those challenges. Um, uh, so that's, that's, that could be one of the uh, topic of discussion, for example. Yeah. So, so let's, let's start with launch. So I'll start with launch. Uh, 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 as you know, uh, uh, launch costs are sort of coming down. And there are some graphs you can see, you can look up the internet of how the per kg uh, launch costs are coming down uh, thanks to a lot of uh, uh, commercialization in, in, the, in the space sector. Uh, so, so with that, with that sort of uh, scenario in mind, I'm going to ask questions to all of you. So maybe each of you can comment on that uh, in terms of uh, 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 where do you see as uh, you know the, is, is, is launch no longer a bottleneck? Is still a, is, is it still economically uh, unviable? Is it you know do you still want to see a lot of progress in terms of uh, in that direction? Uh, so maybe I'll start with uh, George. You can talk about uh, you know uh, what do you see as launch as an issue or not. Sure, um, very excited to talk about launch. Um, Blue Origin, as at heart, at its heart right now, is a launch still a launch company. Um, although we are building uh, space systems, they're coming in the future. Um, so I think uh, first, let me talk a little bit about New Shepard, our orbital suborbital launch vehicle. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, New Shepard uh, was a dream of Jeff Bezos uh, from many years back to be able to go into space uh, with a 100% reusable human vehicle, human rated vehicle. Uh, which also can carry payloads. And uh, we did our first human launch in June of, uh, sorry, July of 2021. 
um, which Jeff rode on the rocket uh, up to space and came back a changed person, actually, and uh, fully supportive of uh, doing further uh, development of human spaceflight. But we know that we're not going up to space just for a joyride. Uh, we're going up to space because there are things that we can do in space that will benefit us here on Earth. Frankly, here down on Earth, we have a problem. We have a gravity problem. And so up in space, we can, with the lack of gravity, there's so many other things we can do. Um, but as the problem is, of course, we can't test those things on Earth. Um, so by having a suborbital launch vehicle on which you can put payloads and um, understand how they work uh, more than just a few seconds, although a few seconds is great, um, you want to be able to move from that level of testing to minutes of testing and eventually to orbital platforms. We can do hours, days, or, or even months. Um, so, so New Shepard is a fully operational vehicle. Um, it is, consists of a reusable booster stage um, uh, with a uh, capsule that uh, pops off the top and comes back down onto parachutes. It's about a five minute ride to space and then uh, three minutes in microgravity and then about three or four minutes back down uh, to landing again. Um, the landing comes down under parachutes and then there's a propulsive landing right at the bottom. The reason why all of that is important um, is two main things. The first is experiments that will eventually go to orbit and stay on orbit for long periods of time, whether on a space station or on a other kind of platform, have to survive the launch experience. Uh, launch is a loud, heavy vibration, um, uh, you know, significant acceleration that you have to get through. And so proving out that experiments work well during launch um, and then getting to microgravity and then they're successful in microgravity is something where many uh, parties have actually failed. They've spent lots of research money, lots of effort. They get up there. They're very excited about getting their experiment on a very rare opportunity to fly to space. And then it doesn't work. And it doesn't work because they didn't adequately prepare for the trials and tribulations of the launch experience. So having a, a suborbital platform that allows us to demonstrate the technologies before they go to orbit uh, can be a very powerful capability. Um, the way we've set up uh, New Shepard, well, in the second piece, sorry, is that uh, you can get the experiment back. And you get the experiment back in a, in a uh, nice environment. Um, it's a soft landing. Um, and it allows you to then to see how it worked and to even refly the same hardware with any kind of tweaks or adjustments you might want. So as a prototyping platform or a platform for experiments that don't need months or uh, long periods of time in microgravity, uh, New Shepard is a, is a wonderful platform. Um, it also is human rated, which means it has a very high degree of reliability and a full abort system. So uh, many people spend uh, significant portions of their lives developing, you know, for a particular research effort. Uh, if you lose that research effort on a launch, uh, because launch is still dangerous, um, that can be very traumatic and uh, really slow things down. So the fact that we have a full abort capability throughout the entire, from the pad all the way to uh, the uh, apogee, uh, and then all the way back down to landing, um, I think is a, a very attractive feature. Um, the capsule has uh, either six seats or six bays for uh, microgravity uh, payloads. The payload racks are very similar to what we used to call mid-deck locker equivalents. So on the old space shuttle, we had these lockers that uh, were in the mid-deck, and we still, we still referenced that as a unit of volume and mass that can be carried to orbit. So these lockers are very similar to that um, sort of a size of a small microwave oven. Uh, we can combine several of those together into a larger rack, a double rack, or into a, a, a six-unit box. Uh, uh, for an experiment. So lots of different flexibility on size. Um, there are six of those, so total of six times six, so 36 slots that can be carried. Uh, and in the future, we'll also be able to offer the opportunity for the payloads to fly with an astronaut together on the same flight. Uh, so some experiments, it's useful to have an, a human observer or a human actor in the loop. Uh, that, of course, can be done remotely or can be done uh, in person. Um, this capability right now, we used to launch about once every other month. Um, we're returning to flight very soon. I can't give you the exact date, but within a, a very short time, we'll be starting to resume our new Shepard flights. Uh, and then we'll be flying about once a month with the goal of, of flying even more regularly than that. Um, so it's, a, that's a, it's an exciting capability. Uh, it's very complementary to uh, everybody else's initiatives uh, because having that ability to fly and test and repeat uh, allows people to really uh, build a more robust product. Um, 
in general about launch costs. Uh, they are coming down uh, with reusable first stages and hopefully in the future we'll see other increased reusability of, of, of large rockets. Um, I predict that as we move towards commercial space stations, which I'd love to talk about more, but I'll want to share the mic here a little bit. Um, Orbital Reef is our future planned commercial space station, which will replace the International Space Station. The International Space Station is due to retire uh, by 2030, 2031. Um, that date may change a little bit, but probably not by a lot. It's, a, it's soon to be a three decades old space station. It was designed originally for 10 years, so it's going through its third decade of extension. Um, it's a fantastic platform, but it is a small platform in terms of um, the amount of expansion or logistical capability it can support. So um, as my colleague here has mentioned, there's, there's a lot of experiments on ISS, but there really isn't enough space to do everything we want to do. Um, there's more demand for microgravity research than there is capacity, both in terms of launch capacity and in terms of physical volume on the station. Uh, the next generation of space stations like Orbital Reef will be able to be expandable, or at least ours will be, uh, and that allows us to move from um, a less frequent uh, and, and less uh, easy to get a slot uh, environment to a much more high cadence uh, and allowing people to have more, more flexibility, which will change the dynamics um, along with it. Okay, thanks, George. Um, uh, maybe I'll now deflect the discussion to Xavier. Uh, can, can you comment about you know uh, how you have changed your launch system? I know that you know Gaganyaan is coming up, uh, and a lot of changes. I'm sure is, is, was in the works in the launch. So maybe you can comment on that. Yeah. So as you know, we have ISRO has three proven and operational launch vehicles: uh, PSLV, GSLVM, and uh, GSLV Mar 3. So GSLV Mar 3 is being upgraded and uh, human rated to take the human spaceflight mission, which we call the Gaganyaan mission. So the launch vehicle upgradation and testing is almost completed and our crew module is uh, being developed. So we will have initially some unmanned missions to prove the technology, so then we'll be going with the manned mission. So both in the unmanned missions as well as manned missions, we are planning a microgravity experiments. So as Judge was pointing out, where human intervention is required, we'll be having in the manned missions. And where uh, it can be, uh, without human it can be managed, it can go in the unmanned missions. And PSLV, you know, the PS4 stage also goes into orbit because it is uh, ejecting the satellite there. So there also we have a novel concept where this is converted into a orbital experimental platform with the uh, extended life of a few months. It has got all the navigation systems, telemetry systems, as well as power systems. So some of the experiments we are now doing in the POEM also. We call it POEM. So in that also now experiments are there, but only drawback is there. We will not be able to get back the experiments. We will only get the results. So with the, our, uh, we are planning to increase the launch capability with the new launch vehicles also. So with that, I think we will be able to take up more uh, missions as well as more uh, microgravity experiments. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what I want now, uh, Yoshioka, Ajay, and Sebastian to comment on is how launch affects your uh, your plans? I mean, launch costs, it can be launch costs, it can be the vibrations that George was referring to. How does it affect your, uh, your for example? Yeah. Yes, uh, as a, a service provider of the space experiments, the challenge is uh, a late access to the launchers. Because uh, some bio-experiments require the uh, late access to the uh, rocket like uh, a few days or one week before the launch. But uh, for example, if you use uh, SpaceX, and uh, if we are uh, uh, ride share the SpaceX, uh, they require like uh, two months before the launch to integrate the rocket. But uh, you know, uh, we uh, take care of the uh, alive sample, so we need the more uh, uh, late access. So yeah, we are also looking for the uh, launchers who can, you know, uh, provide the uh, late access. So yeah, I was uh, wondering if there are any, you know, uh, launching companies in India who can provide the yeah, late access with a reasonable price. Yeah. Ah, okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah, Ajay. Yeah. Sir, um, I can actually speak in two perspectives. So one is um, uh, the Indian perspective, and then the global thing. So uh, in India, so we have, as uh, Sir mentioned, so we have a platform called Poem. So this this kind of platforms can kickstart the experimentations, which can you know provide the data. So uh, 
So in the scale of the, the experiments getting uh, from the research to the commercializations, you need to have a complete high frequency of launches going to space and then you need to have a long durational flights in the space so that these kind of things need to be you know uh, uh, it should it start it should start evolving so that it happens much more quicker and then the research in in a, in a period of 2 to 3 years the research can convert into a commercial product and where you do in space manufacturing and you can bring to the end users this is one perspective and another perspective is most of the biological experimentations, if you see, they, they need to have uh, the shelf life in space. So it's not like some satellites or something uh, where you, you do have some lifetime or something. But whereas in biological experiments need to have a facility that can take to space much more faster. And once the experimentation is completed, you need to bring it back to Earth and then you need to store in a proper place to get the results much more accurate. So these are some areas that we see that uh, India should get much more, uh, uh, it should build its own facilities. Right now, Wellon is trying to identify the facilities in India so that it can make the access for the customers quicker so that uh, from the laboratories it can take to the launch site and then from the launch site again it can come to the laboratories much more quicker. Yes. Yeah, Sebastian, I know you're more into the retrieval, but uh, how does launch affect your, your product or you know what you guys are doing? Yeah. Yeah, maybe I can add a little bit of a European perspective to this. Um, so for Atmos, we are only building return vehicles, right? So we, we always need a launch vehicle to launch our return capsule first. And, you know, Europe is in a very special situation currently. Um, you know, I remember when I was uh, doing my, my master's like 10 years ago, um, Ariane Esbas was still dominating the, the market for co uh, commercial satellite launches with the Ariane uh, 4 and then the Ariane 5. And uh, back then were the first tries of vertical landing by Blue Origin, also by SpaceX. And uh, I, I remember that it was not taken too seriously actually in, in Europe. Uh, there were a lot of doubts about the technical and economical uh, feasibility and so uh, there was a decision made that Ariane 6 would also be not reusable. And now we are at a, in a position where Ariane 5 has been launched for the last time and Ariane 6 is not flying yet. So Europe actually doesn't have its own launch capacity right now. So the interesting thing is that in Europe we, we have a race now ongoing between several commercial companies. Uh, in Germany alone, where I'm from, there's like three different launch companies, uh, ESA Aerospace, uh, they have collected several hundred million RFA and high impulse, and then we've got uh, companies in, in France like Latitude or in uh, Spain like PLD or Orbex in the UK. So there's really a race between several companies right now, but they're not flying yet, right? So for us, for Atmos, we are actually looking at international options right now uh, to launch maybe from the US, maybe from India uh, with, um, with available vehicles right now because we are in a, in a very unfortunate situation as Europeans currently. Okay, thanks, Sebastian. So, so maybe George, you know, uh, you should have talked about this uh, time access issue. So, how do, do you have any solutions, or what do you guys plan to do to help, uh, you know, Yoshioda to sure. access? Sure. Uh, yeah. So, I think with with regards to time access, uh, the one beautiful thing about the suborbital uh, New Shepard rocket is the time access is is pretty quick. Gotcha. Um, we can go from uh, first contact to flight in a relatively short period of time, mm -hmm. uh, as long as there's a capacity available, of course. Um, and then, you know, when the, when the uh, integration, as long as you follow what I'll call the standard uh, protocols for fitting your experiments in the box, and we have a whole payload user's guide to support that, uh, then we're pretty flexible. And, uh, and then, of course, when the payload comes back down, it's literally as easy as opening the hatch and going in and grabbing your payload, and, you know, you can drive it to your lab within a few hours, right? So in that sense, uh, the access is probably as, as almost as good as you're going to get. Okay, okay. So, so that, that brings the question of standardization, right? Mm -hmm. But do you think this is, is this for a, at least for the launch for microgravity? Can it be experiments or it can be even commercial use of microgravity? Do, do you ever see standardization coming? And how, how, you know, I want others to comment on the standardization part as well. Yeah. So I think the standardization part is, is there to some degree. Yeah. Uh, because ISS is an international space station, uh, amongst at least the five international partners, including the many countries of Europe as, as one, um, 
you know, there are a series of uh, standard interfaces already there for sending, I'll call these locker size payloads to ISS, uh, again, dating back from the space shuttle era. Uh, and that standard has persisted into the current era and the plans for future uh, space stations as well as uh, the uh, suborbital uh, New Shepard flight. However, that being said, um, standards shouldn't always stay static. There's always room to continue to evolve how those, those standards should work. And I think as we have more and more nations capable and interested in participating in microgravity research, uh, there's certainly room to continue to look at that. And, and I would probably defer to some of my colleagues who are working on um, Actually, yeah, uh, other vehicles. The, yeah, yeah, I could yeah. reflect the question to Ajay. I know that you're building these lab platforms, right? So maybe standardization will really help you, or you think, or it's going to sort of uh, be, you know, uh, against the competitive spirit, right? I mean, you don't want somebody else to have the same uh, thing that you can just port from your setup to theirs, for example. So maybe you can comment on that. Yeah. Uh, sir, um, uh, standardization is important because uh, uh, all the labs that we are building, so what we used to refer is the mostly successful launches or successful missions what ISS has done. So as George mentioned, so about this uh, ISS standardization, the racks. So those are the, some similar things that we used to follow right now. But this can help out during this, you know, the samplings and then some testing of stuff. But when you go to actual manufacturing, the entire system changes. But at the time, uh, we, we need to look on into some unique uh, uh, adapters that, you know, easily dock or maybe both with the, the platforms or maybe with the stations that is available. So these are something that we see. But initially, to kickstart, yes, we can have a standardizations where it, the platforms can be easily fitted with any of the platform that is globally available. Um, uh, during the manufacturing stages, I think it will be differing. Sebastian, your comment on standardization? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned the, the mid-tech locker, like flown on the space shuttle, flown on the ISS, and we hear it from customers also over and over again. It's like the big ones are mid-tech locker size, and so our vehicle, Phoenix, is actually able to fly three of these mid-tech lockers. Um, and then we also hear that the companies want to do those mini laboratories, and they are typically in, let's say, 1U, 2U, 3U standard sizes. And it's, it's really good to have that standardization because for us, it means that we can use the same adapters over and over again and that saves cost in the end. That saves the, you know, it brings the price down for the customer. Okay. Yeah. Just to add to that a little bit, uh, we all drive cars that fit on roads that are a certain size. And that all dates back to chariots and in horses and, you know, things like that. So there is some degree a a legacy that will always propagate, um, sure, sure. but it also is, it, it propagates because it makes sense. You know, something that's yay big is the right size for many experiments to fit in. And then you can you can build that as a building block into larger sizes. So there's, there's some rationale to why the standards are the way they are. But I think we should mention one thing. Um, there are many different things you can do in microgravity. Uh, and some of them fit nicely into, um, I'll call it science boxes. Sure. But there are other things that you want to do in free space, and whether that is uh, human biological activities, um, or perhaps uh, con construct a future space structure. Yeah, you just need more space in some, uh, in, some and you, Yeah, there are other things we could do. And so, you know, the Gaganyan missions, uh, some of the microgravity research, I'm sure, will not fit in a box. It'll be something that they take out of a bag or out of a pouch or something like that, and they're going to use the free volume inside the vehicle. So we shouldn't limit ourselves to thinking about, you know, things that just fly in boxes. So, so Yoshida, you, do, 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 standards affect, do standardization affect your product, the way the product will be used, you think, or it is, is, is doesn't matter? Yes, uh, our company doesn't manufacture satellite, but uh, we have uh, several satellite partners who is developing a satellite, and uh, uh, Mr. S uh, Sebastian is uh, yeah, uh, our partners. So it's, you know, the standardization is the key to success in the commercial business because uh, we cannot uh, customize uh, our uh, experiment devices to you know, fit to the each satellite. So yeah, that's yeah, very important okay. for us too. Uh, maybe a question to Zavir related is, do you think ISRO will follow uh, a sort of a accepted standard or do you think we should set a new standard that's more customized to the Indian uh, scenario, you think? Or? Yeah, first to reply to Ajay, See, part of our microgravity experiments, we are uh, planning uh, biological payloads also. So these biological payloads loading inside the crew module can be as late as say, a few days from the launch. And at launch site also, we are uh, setting up a suitable ecosystem because 
when a biological payload is flying, one more pay payload has to be on the ground as a control group. So all that uh, infrastructure is also being planned. And once the crew module returns, within uh, 12 to 24 hours, we'll be able to get the sample also so that that experiment's results can be taken. So as for the standardization is come, uh, concerned, it is a very important aspect because what we are seeing with the, our interaction with the principal investigators is that they are mainly uh, more than concentrating on the scientific part. They are struggling more on the uh, how to take care of the power systems, telemetry, et cetera, and uh, the launch loads, how to qualify them and all. So standardization helps a lot in uh, simplifying the efforts so that they will be able to more concentrate on their scientific part. And also, it is better to have uh, interoperability because uh, one experiment designed for one mission should not be uh, tied up to that mission. It should be able to fly in other missions also. And as George was pointing out, again, this should not become a constraint for other experiments because some experiments will uh, require more volume, more uh, different requirements will be there. So that also will be, should be able to accommodate. Okay, I, I, I hope I'm, um, the audience is following sort of what the picture is, right? So we, we talked a lot about launch and uh, standardization and things like that. So let's talk a little bit more about the platform itself. Yeah? So for us to be able to run an experiment or even long-term manufacturing, you need to have a platform in place. So I want the panelists to now comment on platform. Um, uh, maybe I'll start with Jaj. I know he has a platform already sort of, so maybe you can talk about your platform. Yeah. <clears throat> Sure. Orbital so, Reef. Yeah, so so is, when you yeah. say platform and you go like this, uh, of course I have to think about a destination in space. And so uh, <laughs> I'll go to talk about Orbital Reef. Yeah. Um, so obviously New Shepard does not fly to orbit. Um, so it's only a few minutes of, of microgravity. Um, and ISS, uh, it's great, has limited access. And of course it's only the five partner groups um, not open as easily to other nations. So um, we have decided that the future International Space Station and we do think it should be international, um, it should be open to everyone uh, on a more commercial basis. Um, so Orbital Reef is designed to be the world's first uh, commercial international space station. Um, the first uh, block of Orbital Reef is about 90% the size of ISS, um, but it has a lot of benefits that ISS uh, didn't have um, in terms of the systems and how it works. Uh, there'll be much fewer EVAs, it'll be a much lower cost system to build and to operate. And It'll also have be, there's a strong focus on the logistics. So a destination is great. The destination is far away. The next most important thing is the logistics of accessing that destination. And so we have, um, at the moment, uh, two uh, announced um, systems that will be available to transport crew and cargo to ISS. Uh, that's the Boeing Starliner and the Sierra Space Dreamliner, uh, sorry, Dream Chaser. Um, and uh, we are very interested in making Gaganyan be another uh, opportunity for Indians to bring, to be able to fly to Orbital Reef. Um, and we are interested in having uh, more countries participate in Orbital Reef. Orbital Reef is designed uh, with a central spine with the ability to add application modules to either side. And uh, that means really anybody who has the will and the financial resources uh, can bring and attach a module to Orbital Reef. But modules are big. And so the modules themselves are then designed to break down into smaller uh, units, which can be uh, leased either short term or long term, uh, or even take a half a module or a quarter of a module and build your own facility. And what's interesting about that is depending on who you are, you may have concerns about privacy, uh, competitive intelligence, um, or even uh, national considerations where you don't want your experiments to be open for everybody else to see. On ISS, everything is shared by everybody. Um, NASA and uh, JAXA and the European Space Agency and, and Roscosmos, we all work together, and everybody has pretty much full access to the rest of the station. Um, on Orbital Reef, you have the flexibility to have shared access or to have separated compartments according to each, uh, each user's needs. So it gives a whole new way of doing things, and because it's commercial, we can adapt to evolving uh, needs of, of the market as time goes on, both civil markets as well as consumer and commercial markets uh, down the road. So it's, uh, it's an exciting new platform. It's a new era of how we're going to do things in the future. Uh, but now is the time, since we're still in the early stages of putting this together, is really the time for various nations and users to step forward and tell us what our needs are. Because although okay. we're adaptable, on that note, maybe, we do know, uh, yeah. know the needs. Maybe on that note, I'll ask Ajay the question. You know, so so what would it take, or what is your challenges in you know renting a space in George's platform? Yeah. 
can you comment on that? I mean, what, would, you, would you do that? What is it, what is it that required uh, for, you know, for you to be, uh, you know, be able to do that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, uh, so we work on two sectors, like both the biotech and then the uh, material science. So most of the biotech experimentations, uh, it needs very less power in the initial stages, and uh, uh, it, it needs to have its own pressurized chambers, and then which is already you know, uh, Blue Origin has the things. But when it comes to the material science, it needs to have much more higher power, and then a lot of other things need to be constrained, which we are still trying to identify those things. And um, uh, coming about the platform, the platform that Velon builds is uh, two things. And this one is the lab on lab in space, that is our Velon Space Lab Mark One, and then the lab on Earth, that is a kind of a, a laboratory facility which can provide the uh, provide this uh, investigators or the customers to completely control their experimentation and get the results back. So in that case, uh, similar to how ride shares happened for satellites, so we are trying to you know put all the biological customers payload in one box so that so that you know multiple experimentations can happen in just uh, in a small cubic boxes. And um, coming back to this other perspective is about the the dedicated launches. So dedicated launches will also happen once these small experiments are. Uh, once they have been identified that these experiments can be taken to the next stage, so that will convert into a dedicated. So during the dedicated launch uh, or dedicated proposals, we would need some power and then we need some more pressurized chambers and uh, again, we need to get much more faster interfaces because when I say about controlling the experimentation from the ground, you need to have very less lat latency or very less uh, uh, delay to get the data back. Otherwise, what happens is uh, you can't actually control or conduct an experiment quicker. Mm -hmm. So to provide a replication of conducting a laboratory in the same lab that is on the ground, so that it should also be similar in space, so that fast uh, you know, data coming much more faster back to Earth, and then if you do some controls, you, you should conduct the experimentation much more quicker, so that you won't have any lag in the experimentations. These are something that I need to add up. But, yeah. but, but Ajay, do you, do you eventually see a Velon space module attached to the orbital reef? Is that something that is uh, that's yes, sort of Yes, exploring the, plan? the opportunities. Okay, <laughs> yeah. all right. Okay, now, since so you, Sebastian, I know you're working on retrieval systems, but if, if, if uh, you know, Blue Origin already offers both launch and uh, send back capability, where does that put you? Or are you going to, you going to partner with Blue Origin to do the retrieval? Uh, I think both is actually possible. Okay. Um, so, the niche that we see currently is that when you want to do life sciences in space, uh, you often need a specific time in orbit. Let's say you want to stay for 17 days and then you want to return. Right? So if you try to do that today on the International Space Station, it's almost impossible to do because like the, the big capsules, like the SpaceX Dragon, for example, they have like three tons of capacity. They go up there, they stay a couple of months, and then they return. So there's no way for you to get your cells back after 17 days. Right? And we are building a small vehicle that can do specifically that. And this is how we want to enter that market. Um, but I think in the long run, there's also some synergies here because, for example, if somebody conducts those types of experiments uh, on orbital reef, for example, and that person really wants a dedicated ride back down to Earth, this could be an option actually for our uh, capsule systems also to work with the space station and just return from that. I'd like to add to that a little bit because uh, the beauty of something like Orbital Reef is that we, we're intending to be uh, adaptable to new technologies and new things that come along. Um, I, I think that uh, there is definitely a need for certain experiments to be able to have rapid return or incremental return, right? So that you could say, I, I want to bring back my this part of the experiment, but now because we're a space station, we can put together another re experiment right there on the spot, adapt from what we learned on the first one and then send that result back. And so you can have results coming back as you need them, mm -hmm. rather than um, uh, waiting until you replan a whole other mission. Okay. So increasing the cycle time and making it more attractive. I think one of the big challenges we have is we, we're great at basic research in space right now. We've been learning how to do this for about 50, 60 years. Um, we've got a lot of systems and capabilities. We can have startups that can now jump into the fray with products that are, are relatively sophisticated relatively quickly. That's, that's great, but how do we get beyond basic research? How do we, we go from basic research to applied research and from applied research to applied engineering and commercialization? 
or otherwise uh, make it uh, attractive to benefit us all here on Earth. And so having additional systems, whether it's rapid return or the ability to uh, innovate in real time on a platform rather than treating it like it is uh, a, a six-month planning exercise, a six-month launch, launch exercise, and then you have to wait two years before you can fly again. I think changing that whole paradigm is what all of us here on stage are, are contributing to. Uh, question to Zavir. Uh, do you see, uh, 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 I know that there is a plan for uh, our own space station, Indian space station as well. Uh, do you see that as a, another uh, you know, sort of a, a competitive space to you know, Blue Reef? Uh, uh, so what is, what is your take on uh, how in India plans to uh, exploit the space station and the pla orbital platforms that are, that are planned? Yeah. So our current crew module, uh, which is part of the Gaganyan mission, can have a maximum orbital life of around seven days. So it can be slightly enhanced in the future. And uh, it can be adopted to dock to International Space Station as a, and the orbital reef also. Mm -hmm. So it can be used as a ferry vehicle, both for cargo as well as for the crew. And uh, based on how the international scenario evolves over a period of time, it may be that uh, there may be a ISS Indian Space Station also in the future. In the future, yes. Okay. okay uh, actually, uh, maybe I'll ask you, Shira, to comment on what does Japan plan to do? Is there any plans on, uh, you know, to develop your own uh, launch and orbital platform retrieval systems? Are you aware of uh, what's, what's the scenario there? Yeah. Yes, uh, Japan is, uh, you know, uh, really wants to have established their own launching rocket. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, they tried to uh, early this year and it failed. But still, they are trying to, you know, obtain their own uh, launching capabilities. Also, uh, Japan is uh, belongs to the ISS operation, so we have the experiment module, you know, uh, dedicated to Japan. So, but the also uh, ISS will be retired in 2030, so we have uh, some plans to have our own, uh, you know, next post ISS. But uh, you know, uh, IDK is uh, developing automated biolaboratory, so basically uh, our target is, uh, you know, more. Uh, Easy and uh, basic research or the uh, experiments which are not uh, so technical. So, uh, when we think about uh, we will send a thousand of human beings to a uh, moon uh, by 2040, we need a hundred times or one thousand times of number of experiments compared to the, this, uh, you know, uh, uh, ISS. So yeah, we are uh, see you know uh, yeah we are trying to target uh, uh, those uh, basic research using uh, our uh, you know automated bio laboratories. Uh, George, I want to pick up on the one point that you talked about was uh, going from uh, basic experiments on to you know uh, engineering and commercialization. So so do, so do you see a point where you know there'll be like fl really floating factories where you know uh, you will have not just small small you know modules, but you know, eventual factory kind of space where you know, Ajay or uh, you know, others, uh, or uh, setups will be there, or Sebastian systems can come and uh, have like a logistic, as you said, trucks coming in and going out, so to speak, scenario. Uh, the, did you envision something like that? I know Jeff Bezos said, you know, we'll, we'll make everything in space and Earth will only be a living, uh, living quarters, so to speak. I mean, uh, is that where the direction is going? Uh, it depends on what time frame you're talking about. <laughs> uh, um, but yes, I think uh, we do envision that uh, as more and more capabilities are developed in space that you will see uh, uh, space business models and ability to use space to grow significantly. Um, in the long run, uh, we believe that uh, Earth's gravity well is a disadvantage we'd like to move beyond. So being able to source resources from the moon in the very long run uh, so that we don't have to bring everything from Earth, uh, will both protect Earth and also allow us to greatly expand in space. But that's maybe getting a little bit ahead of, that's, that's farther beyond the Kármán line than maybe this panel was intending. I think in the near term, though... Well, the uh, is beyond Kármán line. So yeah, beyond Kármán line is didn't, the, didn't the, it. I the edge of space. <laughs> um, so uh, I think that uh, one of the things that we're realizing is that if we want to bring you know, uh, industry into space, Right now, uh, in the U.S., which uh, and, and to some degree in Europe, there's in Japan, there's a, a, there's a lot of activity in microgravity research, but it is struggling to scale. And part of the reason why it's struggling to scale is because the budgets for civil space are limited to only so much. 
And so oh, while we can get better at using those budgets by miniaturizing and doing other creative things, um, we need to find a way that we can bring other capital sources into the picture. So whether that is non-space agency uh, entities, so uh, agricultural research entities, um, biological research entities, I mean the biotech and the biopharma industry are each hundreds of billions of dollars per year. Uh, the question is how do those users decide that space is just as easy or attractive as the terrestrial option? And so no, I think but, we, you know, we but you know, George, sorry to interrupt you, but that's only possible if there are products that are identified that will, you know, that, that benefit from being in space, right? You can't make everything that you, you know, in space, right? I mean, there are, there are clearly products that exploit microgravity, so to speak. So though, and those products have to have value when you come back here. And then, you know, that, 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 that's the only way I, I see as being uh, able to attract those uh, there, products. Right? There are a lot of, almost everything we can do on Earth, we can also do in space. And we do it, when we do it in space, we, do, we get new knowledge or new ways or new capabilities of doing things that we can't do on Earth. The, the access question, the logistics access, is really the key issue. But when we think about in space, there's space for Earth and there's space for space. So one of the eight things that is uh, very interesting is if we get to the point where we can bring up, um, I'll call it raw material, mm -hmm. and use 3D printing or other manufacturing techniques in space, you could potentially be building satellites in space that don't have to survive launch loads. Sure, and so sure. your whole structural concept of how you design and uh, manufacture in space changes. So uh, above, you know, when we think about microgravity, it's not only the biopharma side. It is also uh, whether it's for space exploration, you want to build a mission to go to Jupiter. There may be ways of building that future mission in space at a lower cost um, and with much more capability than what we can do because we're limited to a, a uh, payload fairing launching off of the Earth gravity well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so that brings us to the interesting topic of, uh, you know, uh, there's one thing about doing stuff in orbit, you know, LEO or closer to the Earth, and there's one thing about being on the base of a moon or Mars and so forth. So, for example, Sebastian, do you see your services extending to uh, retrieval systems or return systems from the moon and bring back things, or is it just going to be only orbit right now? So right now it's actually just going to be low Earth orbit. We are really focusing on the commercial side of uh, production in low Earth orbit and uh, not really looking at uh, moon return or Mars return. Okay. In the long term, I cannot tell you. Um, we are looking at different fields also. There's very futuristic things going on in, let's say, asteroid mining and so on. But uh, this is not something that we see on the, on the short term. We're okay. focusing on low Earth orbit. Okay. Now, uh, how about you, Ajay? I mean, do you, do you see, uh, uh, you know, stuff being made in Moon? You're, do you see a well-on space base in, uh, in Moon where you can do better things there, even though it's 1.6G, uh, for example? Uh, what do you think? Yeah. Yes, sir. So right now, uh, we are, uh, as um, uh, Sebastian mentioned, so right now we are trying to focus on the LEO biomanufacturing Leo, and okay. LEO-based uh, semiconductor research and all. Uh, but who knows, but things can, you know, change when technologies need to have much more capabilities, you know, when exploring something. For example, you know, diamond growing in space is a big thing that is happening in India. So maybe those products can be used as a tools for, you know, getting some, uh, uh, you know, minings or some things that has happened. But, okay. but yeah, but uh, right now uh, I can't comment on that, but maybe in future, future. we can think about that. So, 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 Xavier, can you comment on, I know Chandrayaan is coming up and uh, what is the, the long-term, uh, I think, plan, do you think plans of India in, in the moon? Are you going to have bases there, you think we, we can, uh, you know, have a long-term establishment of uh, Indians in space, you think, uh, in the moon? Yeah, again, it depends on the time frame you are talking about okay. and uh, we have to keep on expanding our frontiers. For example, now we started with the launch vehicles, now we have gone into the human space flight missions. So, once we uh, conquer or master the low Earth orbits, Naturally, we have to progress. The next step will be Moon, Mars, asteroids, like that it will go. Okay. 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 So, um, my clock says that we have roughly about uh, you know, 10 minutes to 120 is the lunch time, I think. So, I now I, I want to uh, engage the audience. So, if you have any questions, you have a lot about launch platforms and so on and so forth and experiments in, in microgravity and exploiting microgravity. So, yeah. So, questions from the audience. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, 
can it be converted to a scientific lab which can go into serve orbital or LEOs and actually humans can go along with the lab and perform experiments there? Will it be, how will it impact the experimentation part in microgravity? And the second question is, is to the entire panel, apart from automization of scientific experiments, the restrictions of the human biology, how will that impact the long-term experiment, uh, scientific experimentation in microgravity? So the reusable launch vehicle is in the initial phases where the experiments are going on. So once it fully matures like a space shuttle, it can be used for uh, future experiments and uh, going to low Earth orbit, docking, all that type of possibilities are there. Uh, I guess I'm the human space flight person on the panel, so I'll, uh, I'll maybe speak to that and maybe uh, we have uh, some other uh, folks with biological experience. Um, Yes, indeed, humans going into space, we are not naturally adapted for low Earth orbit. So we have to have countermeasures. Uh, flights up to a few weeks to a month, uh, you don't need to do a lot uh, in terms of countermeasures. Beyond about a, a month, uh, then the human body uh, does have degradation that needs to be uh, managed. We don't know actually how that will work once we get to the moon or maybe Mars, where Mars is about a third of our gravity and the moon, of course, one sixth. Um, so there are a lot of questions about uh, how humans will survive in space absent a natural gravity well. Um, we do know that we have uh, successfully mitigated many of those uh, issues in the, um, I'll call it the intermediate term, so three to six months, no problem, uh, out to a year, doable, but there are some uh, incremental consequences to your performance, uh, both in your vision, um, of course, mass, muscle mass and, um, and, and bone marrow. Um, so I think there's lots more to learn in this area. There's also, as we build the next generation of platforms, we may be able to have new technologies for mitigating those capability, uh, issues as well. Yeah, I just want to add on another thing, like uh, an add on another information what he said. So uh, when human flight missions happen, so what exactly uh, happens is a recent article that has been published on uh, biomanufacturing in space. So 50% of the, the muscle mass will reduce for the humans. And then almost 1.2% uh, of uh, the bones get damaged. So uh, an alternative solution what people are trying to use is, you know, there is something called organoids and then, you know, something called lab on chip, organ on chip. So they do experiments in a very miniaturized way to understand how this affects the humans. Instead, you test animals in space. So animal testing animals or testing clinical trials for animals in the earth itself, it's getting, they're trying to reduce it and convert into, uh, you know, bio uh, printing of organs that can do in space. And you can understand how this will affect when you, when, you know, now, right now, astronauts are going to space, but eventually uh, when humans trying to go to space so that we can understand something. And more than that, we can also study about how this cancer, because many space travel, you know, they end up with some, some sort of research in cancer kind of products. So maybe some sort of medicines can be, you know, developed for these actions also. Yeah. Uh, just one quick addition. That's actually the thing that makes me most excited about all of this. Like life sciences in space, this can pretty much benefit every person on Earth. Like also people that have nothing to do with space at all. And that's, that's really exciting for me. I'd like to echo that too, is that all, all of the challenges of overcoming uh, spaceflight are directly feeding back into technologies and capabilities that help on Earth. So osteoporosis, um, other effects of aging, uh, we are learning to better deal with that because to run a study on Earth, you have to wait till somebody gets to be you know, from 20 years old to 80 years old. That's a long time to run a study. Um, in space, we can see those effects in a much shorter period of time which means we can more rapidly innovate uh, how to deal with these issues and then bring that benefit back to Earth. Uh, uh, on a related note, you know, this, uh, this, there's this question of automation as well. You know? If you can't have too many human uh, beings there for too long of a time, how does, uh, uh, does automation, that, as it exists today, does it have to evolve to, to meet you know, the automation required to be in? I know you're working on remote platforms and so forth. Maybe you can comment on that as a, how you see Automation is sort of affecting uh, things here. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, um, automation can be for a period of time. So, you know, automation is not only the only way of solution to send these experimentations. 
So why automation comes into picture is, you know, most of the experiments that we see, it's, it's, it's very small and then it can be, uh, you can use some sort of uh, 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 simulations in the space to understand how things happen. But over the period of time, you know, you need to have someone taking care of the experimentation in a bigger scale, and it go to a bigger scale when we speak about space factories and all. So we need to have some human interaction that is happening. But, but, but that's when Orbital Reef will have this humanoid robots walking around and taking the phone calls from Earth. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm assuming. But, you know, right? it's interesting. Uh, we, even though we're building a human space station, we are also looking very much at automation. Uh, automate, automation. Um, what we want to do is try an automate automate those low value added tasks, mm -hmm. moving cargo around, setting up experiments, things like that. Excellent. So if we can lower those costs, then we'll have uh, uh, a more efficient space station that can do other things at a lower cost for other users. Um, and I, and we are not opposed to all these other technologies on the table. I think we see uh, those capabilities as additive uh, to the opportunity. And last comment, um, we talk, since this is about microgravity above the Kármán line, the whole human experience beyond research is also interesting. You know, if we think about our global economy, what percentage of our global economy is research and development and science? It's an important part, but it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, fraction of the total of what we do. As humans, we have an entire other set of experiences, arts and culture and fun and games and sports and, you know, dipl diplomacy and all of those other aspects and all of those also exist above the Kármán line. And so I think while you know, the science and technology side is kind of geeky and fun and exciting, and of course hopefully helps the human experience, everything else about humanity is changing and interesting above the Kármán line as well. Okay. okay, other questions from the audience? Yes. Well, life sciences, yeah, you or Sebastian or Ajay or yeah. Yeah. Um, so maybe maybe I can start. Um, so what we hear from from customers and uh, is that bioprinting in space um, makes it easier because pretty much. Imagine when you bioprint cells on, on uh, Earth, they will not stick together, right? It's like different than a bioprinting of, let's say, plastics or metals. Uh, the cells will pretty much flow apart and then you end up with a, a pancake of uh, cells, right? So uh, in space, you don't have gravity. So the, stick, the cells can then stick together. You can print something in a matter of hours and then keep it in space for, let's say, two weeks or so until those cells have connected and then you can bring back that finished organoid or organ um, to earth. So from my understanding, I don't have a bio background, as I said, I have a, a, an aerospace and a military background, but from my understanding, this technology is still, let's say, five to ten years out until we are really able to print organs. But Imagine the possibilities, like uh, if people that are currently waiting for a donor heart or a donor liver and uh, in, in a lot of cases, um, you know, waiting uh, without ever getting that organ, if they could get an organ from their own cells without any um, rejection of like foreign cells, it would be a game changer. Like this would save like hundreds of thousands of lives and it's, it's super exciting for me. Are there any comments? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, you know, most of the thing has been spoken by Sebastian, but just to add some, you know, quick thing is, uh, one is, you know, again, India, I can just say from Indian perspective. So speaking with most of the NGOs who are, you know, transferring organs and then uh, some of the in institutes who are building, you know, our uh, products that is related to organs. So the mostly focused area that right now what we have understand is, you know, the retina manufacturing because I, because even I am not from the biotech background, but then I, I'm just trying to learn every day to understand how these things happen. So retina bioprinting is one of the key areas that we see from the Indian perspective because most of the Indians, we have uh, eye problem. And then again, another thing is kidney, that is bioprinting of kidneys in space. So that is going to be much more faster and then much more affordable when it goes to space. 
and uh, as uh, Sebastian mentioned, so uh, these these organs can be personalized. So it can adopt what is your blood group or what is your gene. So based on that, these organs can be built. And adding another point, just an information, uh, this protein crystals that is growing in space can also bring uh, you know, a, a great breakthrough for the drugs that is manufacturing. Not even drugs, but also for the, the vaccines. So these are some areas that we have identified that... Yeah, there's biologicals yeah. and then there's bioprinting of organs, tissues. Yeah, exactly, so biologicals yeah. is what is all the, you know, like yes, the protein yes. synthesis and things like that. Yeah, yes. Sir. Any comments from you, Yoshida? I know your, your product was designed for... Uh, uh, I, I'm assuming life sciences, right? So maybe some comments from you would be nice, yeah. Yes, uh, but uh, actually, you know, uh, they already spoke or what I was trying to say. Yeah, so I have no yeah, additional comment. Okay, sure. <laughs> What about you, Zavi? I know ISRO has done some work with uh, uh, some scientists have given proposals and there's some planned work on bio as well, right? And, uh, anyway, for long-term uh, human space flight missions, this is going to be an essential technology because a uh, few set of people have to survive for years together. Yes. So unless this technology is there, even exploration of more Mars and all may, may will not be possible. And once this technology is available, it will be having immense uh, a benefit for the people on the earth also because it will be a spin-off technology from that. Sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So this carbon line is an imaginary line and is it globally accepted by all the countries to be 100 kilometers or uh, is it up and down or is it ambiguous and how does this distance actually affect it to any kind of applications that have been discussed here? And uh, uh, more and more Mr. from uh, Mr. Kohi, about what, what were you telling about the device? Yeah, maybe yeah. Maybe we'll start with the comment, then we'll come to Carmen line. Yeah. So the, uh, can, uh, can I say again? No. What, what is your device about? What is it that your product? You showed a product. He wants to know more about what is it. About ah, that. I see. Yeah. Our product is a semiconductor chip, and the, there is a photodiodes arranged in array. So you know, the, uh, 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 with the uh, fineness of the uh, photodiodes, we can get the uh, uh, microscopic image on the screen. So for example. Uh, we have a, yeah, I can show you this after this, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, the, I mean, from my understanding of common line, it is an acceptable, accepted line that, that, you know, that delineates so-called space versus Earth. Uh, so that my understanding is that, but yeah, any other comments? Yeah. The, the technical definition is it's the lowest altitude, or the lowest altitude at which you could sustain staying in orbit around the Earth. Uh, at least for a period of time. Uh, it, the atmosphere continues beyond that, so um, if you don't have some way of propulsion or reboost, you will eventually fall back down, even at 400 kilometers. But at 100 kilometers, if you get to that altitude and you're in a circular orbit, you can go around the Earth. You won't immediately come back to Earth and burn up. So it's an artificial, uh, just differentiates between atmospheric flight and exo-atmospheric flight. Okay, so I think we're running out of time here. So I've been shown the timehouse symbol. So, so, so yeah. So, uh, um, uh, on behalf of uh, the audience, and I want to thank all the panelists. Thank you, as a, uh, all of you, for sharing your thoughts here. And I want to thank the audience as well for patiently listening to us and, and, and uh, appreciating the comments that's made. So, so with that, we'll end the session, and yes, uh, I'll please. hand over to. Yeah. Uh, please, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I guess we are all enjoying a cold space here, so you can warm up yourselves with a good lunch outside. The VIPs and speakers would have your lunch in the oval room where the inauguration happened, please. And the delegates are most welcome the tea areas. We would like you to come back around 2.15 or 2 .15, so that we can nicely and timely consume for the forthcoming sessions. Thank you, please. Thank you, the panelists. Thank you so much.